Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to another live stream on the History Vibe podcast. Today, I'm joined by Dr. James David Odlin, and today we're we'll going to be discussing the secret gospel of Mark, vindicating Morton Smith. Welcome back to the podcast, James. Thank you. Always a pleasure. All right. So can you tell us a little bit about the background, about the controversy that surrounded the late Morton Smith? Sure. What sure. was the problem that okay. many had with the secret gospel of Mark at the time? Yes. Okay. To give a, a quick lick and a polish to the current story. In 1958, I was too young to appreciate it, but I certainly do now. Uh, in 1958, Morton Smith, a uh, renowned professor of biblical studies, especially the New Testament, uh, came upon a letter a copy, I should say, of a letter written by Clement of Alexandria. This is not the original. It was a copy made, I, I'm going off memory now, but in the 17th century, if I recall, of a letter that, there you see it, Clement had written to a, to a student answering some questions. The student was curious about passages that some uh, heretical organizations were claiming were stated in a copy a late version of the Gospel of Mark, and Clement sets the story straight. What Clement says in the letter is that there were three versions of the Gospel of Mark. The first version, which uh, we only have fragments of, was written early on by John Mark when he was a student following around with Simon Peter, Simon the Rock, especially in Rome. Simon uh, wasn't much of a writer, but he was quite a raconteur. And so Simon from time to time would say, well, gosh, I remember the day Jesus did this, da, 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 da. or I remember Jesus saying such and so and the other thing. And Mark's job as student was to write down these memories because Mark was good with a pen, unlike Simon Peter, who was a professional fisherman. That wasn't his job. And so he would write these down. And later he assembled those into what was, according to Clement of Alexandria, the first version of the Gospel of Mark. Then when Simon was executed, Simon Peter was executed in Rome, John Mark in inherited the possession of written materials that Simon had also composed of memories of Jesus, and also an, uh, at least portions of a Gospel that he may have written completely, but I and others think that he never finished it. And we have portions of that, by the way, still today. So Mark incorporated some of these materials as well into his first edition, creating a second edition of the Gospel of Mark. And that's the one that we have today in the Christian Bible, in the New Testament. There have been some uh, scribal excisions and interpolations. Scribes always have to mess with the material they have in front of them. But by and large, what we have in the canonical New Testament is this second version of Mark. Now, here's where it gets interesting. Clement of Alexandria relates that John Mark went on to write a third and last version of his Gospel of Mark. And this I've put together from a number of sources, not just Clement's letter, but also some uh, writings of Papias of Hierapolis and others, that John Mark, after he split with Paul, he spent time with Paul as well. John Mark split with Paul. There was an ang angry issue that cropped up on the island of Cyprus. And the result of that was that Paul told him to get lost. And Paul chose another assistant to travel with him. And John Mark at that time went to Ephesus, where lived John the Presbyter. John the Presbyter, of course, is the author of the Gospel of John. John Mark, as I'm sure many of you will remember, is the author of the Gospel of Mark, and the Gospel of Mark is the older of the three synoptic Gospels. That's a Greek word that means they see with a single eye. It's basically, it's a way of saying that they have a lot in common, a lot of passages, almost word for word identical. So here we have John Mark writing a later version than we have in the Christian Bible of the Gospel of Mark that evidently included passages taken from John the Presbyter's drafts for the Gospel of John, those drafts he wrote in Aramaic, and much later in time they were translated into Greek by the, the aforementioned Papias of Hierapolis, 
and collated and organized into a single gospel, which is the gospel of John that we have today. So here we have something very interesting. Generally, people say the synoptic gospels that Matthew, Mark, and Luke have nothing to do with that fourth gospel, the gospel of John. But here we have a connection. So Morton Smith found this copy of the letter, as I said, in 1958 in the Mar Saba Monastery. And he wrote about it, published a book about it, discussing it. And almost immediately, a tempest arose. Morton Smith was accused both of two crimes, in my opinion, both false. He was accused, first of all, of forging this letter, this copy of the letter, in order to uh, prove how gullible other scholars are, that they'll believe anything. And the second false allegation was that Morton Smith was a closet homosexual and that he wrote this letter or, and most especially the passages in it, quoting from the secret gospel, in order to advance the cause of homosexuality. Now, as to the first, that has been thoroughly disproven because a number of scholars came back years later to the same Marsaba Monastery. They found the letter exactly where Morton Smith said he left it. They took careful photographs of it, which we have today and can study. And uh, others have done analyses of these photographs. They have concluded that the handwriting is not one that Morton Smith could have done. Morton Smith's Greek handwriting was terrible. And this is an amazing 18th century Greek manuscript in a flowing hand that Morton Smith couldn't have done to save his life. And there is no sign of writer's tremors, a forger's tremor, uh, I read an essay written by a, a graphologist who concluded that it isn't possibly a forgery. So there's quite a lot of evidence to suggest that it is genuine, not a forgery, not Morton Smith trying to prove how gullible other scholars are. As to homosexuality, needless to say, there is absolutely nothing wrong with being homosexual. But there is something wrong with scholars who accuse one of their fellow scholars of being a closet homosexual in order to dem denigrate him for this. And this, I think, these people need to be held accountable. Morton Smith, I'm sorry that Stefan Haller isn't with us because he interviewed a woman whose mother, uh, whose name was Miriam, was, uh, the daughter was interviewed by Stefan Haller, and Stefan was told by this lady that her mother, who had deceased previously, that her mother was, at the time that this, this letter was found, she was dating Morton Smith and that they were very closely romantically involved. So, not that, again, not that there's anything wrong with being homosexual. Morton Smith wasn't homosexual. So the possibility that he was advancing the cause of homosexuality by forging this letter is bogus. Not only that, but uh, the book that he wrote about the secret gospel is, in my opinion, a pretty sad failure at advancing the cause of homosexuality. It doesn't mention homosexuality whatsoever. The crux of this allegation was part of the letter in which it says that Jesus was teaching advanced teachings to a certain young person and that Jesus spent the night with that young person in the same bed, and that the young person wore only a kiton. That's a Greek word that means a linen shift, basically like a nightgown, you could say. And there's no mention of sex. There's no mention of any uh, anything inappropriate, simply that they spent the night together. Now, some of you might be uh, familiar with history and know that up until recent times, people shared the same bed. My, when I was a young kid, all of my my little brother, all of my cousins and me, we all climbed in the same bed and got and, and slept together in the same bed, six or seven of us. Why? Because up where I come from in way northern New York and the north end of the Adirondacks, it gets pretty cold at night. And if you think that's bad, try winter. So we slept together and we were glad of it. But in modern times, everybody thinks that you only have to have your own bed. Now, we can't look at this text 
in those modern lenses. We have to look at this text and realize that it's talking about an ancient time when people did sleep together and it had nothing to do with sex. But these scholars made this line the crux of their allegation that uh, Morton Smith had forged this to advance the cause of homosexuality, of which he was supposedly a secret member. So that, Jacob, is in a nutshell the story of the controversy. So which Greek words did he um, mistranslate that provides evidence for the authenticity? Uh, that, that What Greek words did he tr mistranslate that uh, have to do with homosexuality or... Well, uh, I want you to talk about the the evidence that he that he mistranslated a couple of Greek words. Oh, sure. Okay. Yeah, right. that's that's what I mean. Okay, sorry, I, I misunderstood. Okay, no problem. Let me let me look at my uh, text here so I know exactly what I'm saying. There's a phrase in Clement's letter. I, I should explain that Clement explains about the origins of the three versions of this of the gospel of mark the first one that i mentioned the second which is in the new testament and the third one which has the modern name of the secret gospel of mark it wasn't called that in ancient times so in this third version there's a there's a phrase aptakis kekalumenes which means seven times sealed and you know i as a scholar of greek amongst other languages i look at that and i know what it means but Smith, unfortunately, made a mistake. He translated this phrase not as seven times sealed, which is obviously an adjectival phrase, but as a nominal phrase with a noun in it. He translated it as seven veils. And a lot of you will think when you hear the phrase seven veils, you'll think of Salome dancing the dance of the seven veils to entertain Herod and uh, securing the head of John the Baptist on a silver platter. Uh, what Smith then went on to say was that the seven veils was referring to the curtains that closed off the Holy of Holies, the innermost, most sacred sanctuary in the temple in Jerusalem. But uh, so his that was his hypothesis to explain this phrase as meaning seven veils. But it actually means seven times sealed, which also some of you who are very familiar with the New Testament will recall that phrase from the Gospel of Revelation, where it talks about a text that John, who is writing this book of Revelation, uh, had written previously that was sealed with seven seals. That previously written text, of course, is the Gospel of John. And there actually are, you, in effect, seven seals in the Gospel of John. Seven times there is a statement of affidavit, someone saying, to the reader, directly to the reader, this we can vouch for as true. So that's why we can talk about the Gospel of John as seven, sealed with seven seals. And we find that mentioned here in the secret letter of Mark letter that, that uh, Clement of Alexandria wrote. And by the phrase, that actually helps us to see that there was this connection between the secret gospel and the Gospel of John. So Smith, you know, made an error. I make mistakes all the time. My first mistake today was getting out of bed. But uh, Martin Smith made this small mistake, and I find it fortunate because it helps us to see that Morton Smith couldn't have forged it. Because if he had translated that phrase in Greek correctly, it actually would have furthered his cause of how he explained the secret gospel. So how did um, other scholars react to finding out about those mistranslations? Did that sway um, any of them that he did not forge these uh, the secret gospel of Mark? Uh, it's hard for me to get a sense. I think the waters are shifting, to be honest. Uh, when, as I said, when the when Morton Smith first revealed the existence of this letter and when he uh, first shared it with the public through his book, there was a, a widespread storm of anger and fury suggesting all sorts of horrible things about, about uh, Smith as supposedly forging this. We, people, some of you will remember these names, the popular people, uh, popularizers, popularizers of the 
Gospels uh, translations, such as Robert Connor, Bart Ehrman, Peter Jeffrey, Stephen C. Carlson. These people put out books for that said it was horrible. But I think I get a sense that these people have had a lot less to say on the subject than probably because I think they know they're wrong. But while I'm not necessarily meaning these people as individuals, generally speaking, I find a lot of my fellow scholars find it very difficult to admit when they were wrong about something. They prefer to you know, kind of like politicians. It, you know, it depends on what your meaning of is, is politicians always wiggle and try to prove that they hadn't, hadn't done anything wrong. And they twist the, the facts around to try to exculpate themselves. Well, I think these scholars are now in something of the same boat as politicians caught in flagranti delicto. So they're basically not saying much of anything on the subject. And I'm hearing more interest in reading Clement's letter and considering it seriously. There's There have been some good books put out recently on the subject. I, I'm especially delighted with a book by a scholar named Scott G. Brown. His book on the uh, on the letter of, of Clement of Alexandria about the secret gospel, I find to be absolutely top notch. I'll be putting out my own studies of it as a part of my larger book dealing with the origins of the gospel of John, because as I mentioned, uh, this secret gospel passages clearly take material from the uh, early version, the draft version of the gospel of John. So I think Jacob that the, that the ground is shifting, that there is more willingness to take seriously Morton Smith's discovery as real. I hope that's the case. But what I really would like to see is some of these people who made these horrible false accusation, accusations of Smith publicly apologize. It takes a big person to apologize. And people who let years and decades go by in which they're false assertions are still out there without apologizing for them, show themselves not to be big people, but little people. So did the secret gospel of Mark, is that the first text that John Mark wrote, or did he write that after writing his initial version? Of no, the gospel this, of this is the third, according to Clement, I wasn't there at the time, uh, my children used to accuse me of, of being around when they invented dirt, but I wasn't there at the time, despite their their claims. And so I don't know for myself, but according to Clement, there were these three versions of the Gospel of Mark. The first one, which we don't have really, uh, was an early draft version made from uh, Simon Peter's oral recollections. The second one, which we do have, it's found in the New Testament. That one was based on Simon's recollections uh, orally and also some written material that Simon did put down. Anybody reading the Gospel of Mark will notice that Simon Peter, Simon the Rock, to translate his name, Simon the Rock is prominent in that Gospel. But this, so this sacred Gospel is the third version and we do not have it complete. We only have two uh, definite passages from it, which are quoted by Clement of Alexandria in this letter. But I am amongst those who believe that there are several other sources that we have that probably also uh, retain for us portions of the secret gospel of Mark or something very closely related. Some of these are pretty well known. The Egerton gospel is an interesting fragment that has been found that has pass has lines in it that are clearly synoptic and also lines in it that are clearly Johannine and they're all kind of blended together, which is exactly the nature of the secret gospel of Mark. I've been just recently, uh, I just I just put it out on the academia.edu website for those interested, my own study of Papyrus Oxyrhynchus 5577. This little fragment, uh, quote unquote, from an unknown gospel also combines Johannine material and synoptic material all seamlessly blended together into a coherent little narrative in this fragment. And so I suspect that Papyrus Oxyrhynchus 5577 may also be from or closely related to the secret gospel of Mark. 
So what I'm saying, Jacob, is while we don't have the secret gospel of Mark complete and entire as a single manuscript that we can go through the pages and read, what we do have is enough fragments that we can at least extrapolate to a pretty confident degree, in my opinion, what that secret gospel looked like, what, what its contents were, what its relationship was with the familiar canonical gospels, as well as the most important of the of the non-canonical gospels, many of which were written at the same time as or even earlier than our canonical gospels. And what became of the manuscript of the Marsaba Monastery? That's a good question. As I mentioned, uh, several scholars did come back later on and took pictures of the uh, manuscript. They, these scholars were there in 1976. They include David Flusser, Shlomo Pines, and Guy G. Straussma, all three excellent scholars. They took photographs of it uh, after finding it exactly where Smith had left it 18 years before. But sadly, uh, in some point thereafter, the letter disappeared. According to the, <coughs> the uh, leaders of the monastery, they don't know where it is. Uh, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, I left out 1983, Callistos Durvas also took high quality photographs. So I, I, I misspoke. The, it was shortly after 1983 that the manuscript disappeared. This, the following statement, what I'm about to make is just a hunch. I have no proof for it. But I kind of think, Jacob, that all of the horrible controversy, the allegations of homosexuality, well, in the Mideast, the Marsaba Monastery obviously is in the Middle East. That's an area where those are sensitive issues. Sexual orientation is not various variant kinds of sexual orientation, which are widely accepted in the West, are not so widely accepted in the Mideast. Uh, it's certainly not also in a monastery, a, an ancient Christian monastery with history going back almost 2,000 years. That would be a significant embarrassment to them. Probably they had scholars arriving at Mar Saba who all wanted to see it, and they don't know who these people are, and they're aware of the controversy. So I think I can't prove it. I'm not alleging anything, but I kind of think that the leaders of the Mar Saba monastery decided to lose it on purpose, and that it's been put away somewhere, and only they know where it is. I but. Really, ultimately, Jacob, that doesn't matter because, as I say, we've got these excellent quality photographs taken. There's just no question that the manuscript existed, that the letter, the copy of the letter existed, and we can study it for what it is. And there's further absolutely no question that it is exactly what Morton Smith said it was. How does the secret gospel of Mark help us understand Mark and or the development of the gospel of Mark? Great question. Today, scholars generally compete with each other, even novelists, because some of you may know in, in my ha, ha spare time, I have written and published a number of novels. Uh, today, we live in a competitive world. The way that you succeed at whatever your game is climbing up the corporate ladder toward greater and greater success is by poking your elbow in the eye of anybody who's trying to get past you and get up that ladder faster than you. So we're all in competition. And if those of you who remember grade school, you were, if you were asked by the teacher to solve one plus one and you said three, you said sit, she said sit down and she asked somebody else and somebody else says, well, one plus one is two. And that person to see has succeeded, you have failed. Competition is a part of our Western society and it is pretty much inescapable. But in the classical time, that wasn't so much the case. And the authors of all of the early gospels, and I include here both canonical and non-canonical because the decision of which gospels were gonna be canonical and which gospels were not, was a decision made centuries later in the first, second century, the third century, when these very early gospels were being written, they were written by people who knew each other, who loved each other, who had in common the their memories of Jesus, either first or second hand. Some of them 
such as John Mark himself, had never met Jesus. John Mark was born uh, in November after, in the same year that Jesus died on the cross. So he never had a chance to meet him. But these people, first or second uh, hand memories, bound them together. They were part of a small community that had to bind themselves together because there were a lot of people out there in the world who didn't like them and didn't like what they had to say and were out to destroy them. So it should not surprise us in that context that far from competing with each other, these gospel writers helped each other. They shared with each other. So what I'm saying is that Mark's second version, the, the version of the gospel of Mark that we have in the New Testament, that has material from Peter. But then the third version, Mark draws in material from John, John the Presbyter, into a new version. And Matthew and Luke, which were written rather later than the Gospel of Mark, they have a great deal of material taken from Mark, but they also have material which sounds like Mark, but it is fuller, it is richer. There's more meat on the bones of these passages in Matthew and Luke than there is in the version of the same passages in Mark. What's going on there? That tells us that Mark, canonical Mark, the second version, which wasn't yet using this material from, the, from John the Presbyter, had the skinny story. It, it had a, this or that story about Jesus, what he did or what he said. But by the time Matthew and Luke were compiling their gospels, they had access to the secret gospel of Mark, that third version. They might even have had access to the original Aramaic drafts of the Gospel of John, one way or the other, Matthew and Luke could put into their Gospels the same story that Mark told, but tell it in a richer ma manner by taking the material from Mark's later secret Gospel version. So if you follow what I'm saying, what I'm saying is we have a beautiful example here of cooperation and sharing. And it wasn't just these Gospels that I mentioned, the Gospel of Thomas. Uh, for example, has a great deal in common with the four canonical Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, as well as others. You see therein passages that are very familiar and also passages which, for lay people, you say, well, I never saw that one before. And there's many other examples of this, early Gospels. The Gospel of Philip, which, by the way, back in 1972 was the Gospel that got me on this path that I'm still on today. The Gospel of Philip is a commentary gospel. It's a study of the Gospel of John. So it quotes the Gospel of John and then reflects on the meaning of it. But it also refers to passages from letters by Paul of Tarsus that we have in the New Testament. It quotes 1 Corinthians, for example. It also quotes from Matthew. So the Gospel of Philip, again, we see, Jacob, this sharing amongst the various Gospel texts that we have. It can drive scholars out of their gourds because trying to trace all this and try to draw lines between them like a family chart, you, you can just twist all those lines into knots because they all share with each other all the time. So I don't get too terribly worried about drawing lines between the Gospels and trying to make it all simple because all we really need to know is these people shared with each other. They loved each other. They were all about the same objective, which was to share with the world Jesus' teachings. So I'm going to shift to this slide now. So can you tell us about this chair? Oops, Oops sorry about that. I, I'm trying to get back to the right screen so I can see what you're... Oh, I know which chair you're talking about. That oh. chair... Okay, yeah, that chair... Uh, this is something that Stefan Huller is especially erudite about, and uh, and it makes me sad that he was unable to join us for what reason we don't know. That is uh, a chair that was found at Alexandria. It is too small for anything but anyone larger than a child to sit in. Uh, so it is really more of a symbolic chair. But this chair uh, has messages... Uh, uh, contextual message on. Let me just pull up the text so I can tell you a little bit about it here. Hold on. I got to get to the right book here. Hold on. Uh, oh, 
one's not in that one. Where did I put it? I think at some point down the line, uh, we can probably do a part two when Stefan uh, is available. That would that would be a great idea. Okay, okay, I can't find it, but um, this chair, this chair is clearly this is where Stefan was really so helpful to me. He really opened my eyes to the importance of this chair. This chair is representative representative of John Mark as the Eastern first Eastern Pope in the Eastern Coptic tradition. Many people might think that the only papacy in the world is that of the Roman Catholics, and that is actually not the case. There are were and are other papacies, and the Coptic tradition, uh, the Coptic, for those who don't know, is a culture and a linguistic tradition that's mainly found in Egypt. Uh, it was one of the my reasons for visiting Egypt is because of its central importance uh, in the story of early Christianity. The Coptic tradition had uh, has a tradition of pap of popes as well, and uh, the first pope by their tradition was John Mark himself, and this chair is related to John Mark. It what's interesting to me is it has a. a in this below the seat where where you actually put your tulkas, if you look at the back of the chair, there's an opening, and, the, and so you can put something inside that opening. And what I believe was kept inside that that chair, and I don't know whether Stefan would agree with me or not, was a copy of the Secret Gospel of Mark, which uh, was by the mandate given by Pope John Mark to the Coptic Christians not to be shared with the world. It wasn't widely published like the other gospels. It was reserved, it was kept aside and only shared with those students of the traditions of Jesus's teachings who were most advanced, most able to read this, this text, the secret gospel of Mark and understand it and appreciate it and not be shocked by it. it was, because it, was, it had so much profundity, so much depth so that's what is important about this chair to me is that it helps us to see the importance that was attached to John Mark and therefore to his writings, this the secret gospel of Mark in, included. And what does this inscription say on the chair? That's what I'm trying to find. And if 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 you can bear with me a little bit, I can I can find it for you. Is this it? Here we go. Yep, I got it. Okay. Uh, it's written in Hebrew letters, but what's very interesting is that the Hebrew is written backwards. I'm sure everybody listening to this program knows that Hebrew, like Aramaic, like Arabic, is written right to left. But this text on the chair, on the front of the chair there, is written left to right, but you still have to read it. It's it's not easy for somebody who's familiar with reading the Hebrew right to left, but if you read it with careful, read it carefully, what the text says uh, is, uh, it looks like it says Mark Evan. Oh, and look who just joined us. There's Stefan. Oh, great. Mark Evangelist of Alexandria. Stefan, there's some um, background I, noise coming from you. Um, I can't really tell. Hi. Right. This is sort of weird. Oh. Try to change your microphone setting. Try. Is it working? I'm going to put you on mute for a second while you figure that out. Uh, okay, James, continue. Yeah, sure. Yeah, the, the, the text on the chair uh, probably goes back, it's in Hebrew, but it probably goes back to an original Latin source that said, Throni Dixi Uelet Marcos Evangelista Alexandrinos, uh, which means the throne said to be of Mark the Evangelist, Mark the Evangelist of Alexandria. So that's what it seems to be about. No 
having such luck with the microphone, oh dear. I'm, I'm here. I mean, I didn't see a picture of the chair. Yeah, but we can barely hear your voice, and there's background noise coming from you. Um, let me try my phone. Okay. Yeah, try your phone. All right, continue, James. Yeah, no. So, okay, that's yeah, just just uh, uh, what the uh, carving says on the on the uh, text. The interesting word to me is the word velut, or velut, if you want to speak classical Latin, which means supposedly. So apparently the original inscription is saying uh, this chair is supposed to be the chair of the evangelist Mark, of uh, Mark the evangelist of Alexandria. And I suspect that what that is about is, as I mentioned, the chair is really too small for anybody but a child. An, an adult such as Pope, Mark, John, Pope John Mark could not have sat in it. So that's that's the importance of this chair. It helps to give historical context to what we know about the secret gospel of Mark. Has this been has this chair gotten any attention from anyone else? Not not terribly much, which surprises me. There've been an there've been a handful or two of scholarly articles uh which haven't really gotten anybody awfully excited. Uh and I wish there were more because I think this chair is really of, of significance. Is it? Uh, one work is by Danielle Gabory Chopin, uh, and it's an article that she wrote, which was published in a collection of essays titled The Treasury of San Marco of Venice, edited by David Buckton. And her article is called in English, The Throne Reliquary, the Sedia di San Marco. And uh, hers is the best item that I've seen on the subject, in addition to, of course, uh, Stefan's own work. Stefan has a blog I recommend to people interested in everything we're talking about to check out Stefan Huller's blog and read it regularly because he's he's got more to say than than whole bunches of other scholars. He his mind impresses me. So I'm uh I recommend his blog to, to folks. And for those who are interested, I gave up my blog. It was too much work. But go to my Facebook page and you can get the equivalent of a blog on my Facebook page. My author page is, where th is the best place to go for that. And I share what latest things I've been working on. So you can always also keep up with my work if it, anybody out there in, uh, in StreamYard land is interested. Just I'm going to take a look question. Quick, see I'll if I had on. anything else to say on the chair. What do you think about this statement from Edward M? I think it is possible Secret Mark was originally composed of, to deflect accusations of homosexuality on Jesus' part that Mark 14, 52 uh, seems to have begged if forged, it was definitely anciently forged. Uh, I think Edward is suggesting that it was that was uh, composed in early times. In other words, Edward, you're not trying to get into the issue of whether Morton Smith was homosexual. Now, the concept of homosexuality is a modern concept. Uh, there's a, um, if I can think of his name, he's a Harvard professor. And, uh, almost had a John. I can't think of his name at the moment, but he, he's written a number of superlative books on the history of the concept of homosexuality, that it's really a modern concept that only really came into play around the time of the Industrial Revolution. In ancient times, people weren't considered homosexual or heterosexual or bisexual or asexual, et cetera, sexual. They were simply were themselves. They were simply people. They were attracted to whoever they were attracted to. And uh, there was, in ancient times, nevertheless, nobody either accused Jesus of homosexual behavior or even suggested that he was involved intimately with other men. Jesus, is, is by the organized religion, was said to have had intimate relationships with nobody, zero. And uh, the 
apostolic tradition coming out of early uh, coming out of Jesus's original teachings consider Jesus to have been married to a woman, Mary Magdalene. And uh, that tradition continues on, somehow struggles through even today uh, in the Middle Ages, the Cathars, the Celtic Christians, the Bogomils, others ha held this view. So it continues to be there. But nobody ever in ancient times ever accused Jesus of homosexual behavior or even suggested he was involved. So, Edward, it's an interesting question. It's a worthwhile question, but my answer is I don't think so. So we got Stefan back. Um, can you hear me okay, Stefan? I hope so. Glad to yeah, see I, you, Stefan. The background noise is gone, so we don't have to worry about that. No problem. Just, just the voices. Um, excellent. I think this would be a good time to go back to what we were discussing earlier. James, could you um, talk about... Um, and Stefan, I'd like you to discuss this as well. The someone that was dating Morton Smith that disputed the homosexuality uh, um, accusations. Yeah, you'll you'll forgive me, Stefan, for encroaching on your territory. Uh, but I, I, I have talking, a territory, I guess. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's extensive, and you're the and you're the ultimate monarch. In, in I, I am. I, I I'm the uh, king of the rubbish heap. Um, I I um, well. You know, Morton Smith, it, it was like a footnote, right? Like, he didn't, like, they make it like it was like he was, like, walking around wearing, like, you know, like a rainbow flag and, you know, talking about Jesus. This is like a footnote, and it scandalized people. He might have thought this was what this what the discovery was about, but he focused, you know, it's like a 400-page book that he wrote and or more, and you know, it gets like a footnote, and then that becomes the focus of everything. Maybe in his private conversations with scholars, he like scandalized them by bringing this up to them. But in print, it was not an important part of his study of the document. And I might, I might add that, uh, as you know, Stefan, I've I've studied the text of the letter, the quotations from the God, secret gospel in the letter with great care, just to refresh people's memory, what is quoted in the letter from the secret gospel is in Greek. But I'm an Aramaist, not only do I read Greek, but I also study Aramaic, and my specialty is 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 Galilean Aramaic, wow. uh, which is very little study. So when I look at the Greek, what I, what I do, Stefan, is in my mind, I reconstruct the probable shape of the Galilean Aramaic that this Greek is a translation of, because Clement would have written in Aramaic at that time. And my extrapolation of the text concludes that the youth with whom Jesus spends the night, uh, the youth wearing just the ketone, was of the female persuasion, that it wasn't male at all, which takes the wind right out of the sails of those who are insistent that Smith wrote that, wrote, forced the letter in order to advance his homosexual cause. It, it's a woman. What more, uh, the text is clear that Jesus instructs this person uh, to wear only the ketone six nights later uh, and come to Jesus at a meal wearing this, this uh, ketone and nothing else. So if you, so in the context of my rest, restoration of the original Aramaic drafts of the Gospel of John, that makes perfect sense because uh, the, the uh, raising of Lazarus from death is followed six days later by the meal that takes place in John chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, etc. The meal at which Mary uh, breaks up, open a, a, a tap, a, a, glass container of nard and anoints Jesus's feet. And uh, I, I want to keep it G-rated, but some of you may be familiar with the fact that feet is a euphemism in the Hebrew and Aramaic languages for the genitalia. So isn't everything, isn't everything though, like uh, a cigar, a finger, I mean, a, a, everything is, right? I mean, like well, everything would be, yeah, in the, in the <laughs> what is it, bottle of coke, right? you know, like, like, anyway, go ahead. Yeah, no, no, <laughs> no I appreciate it. Uh, no, I'm, I'm just saying, I'm summarizing what takes, I said it to Jacob and he probably fell asleep halfway through, but it takes about 40, 50 pages in my book to explain 
how I see the secret gospel as completely harmonious with my reconstruction of the original Aramaic drafts of the Gospel of John, which, again, takes the wind right out of the sails of those mm -hmm. who are saying this is a homosexual forgery, uh, homosexual advancing forgery, also uh, meant to show how gullible scholars could be, all that kind of garbage that was put out there. So well, I missed the conversation because of my tardiness, but um, is, the, is the conversation about whether or not people in ancient times thought Jesus was gay, is that the conversation? No, what we were discussing uh, um, is, did Morton Smith forge the secret gospel of Mark oh. because he was allegedly homosexual? Yeah, so, a, a, is, a, a viewer asked the yeah. question, Stefan, whether, oh. whether the, the secret gospel of Mark might have been written in ancient times in order to counter accusations in ancient times that Jesus was homosexual. Um, do, you, do you want to hear something new? Do you, you want to hear new stuff? Is that is it like is new better than old? Do you want to hear some new stuff? Um, I looked at um, Agamemnon, Agamemnon Selicus's report on, uh, and he says, of course, that the document is a forgery. Yeah. But unlike Stephen Carlson and virtually everybody else who's in this racket, um, he is an expert in in this ligature uh, in in Byzantine handwriting. And he translates naked men with naked men as naked plural with naked. And the plural of naked could be men and women and man singular. So it's an, you know, um, it could be an orgy. It could be a reference to just public nudity. It could be a reference to Plato's judgment of the dead. I mean, but the point is that the specific idea that it was naked man with naked man is what Morton Smith said. And Italicus, okay, I don't know if you know how these Byzantine uh, ligatures work, but um, it's not just simply letter for letter. It, they, they oftentimes will have uh, two letters together or have a, a, a symbol, or even three letters together can have a certain look. So uh, Telekas is an expert. Like he hate, he hates my guts, but he, he used to like me a long time ago. But I guess I'm I'm counted with the uh, vermin or parasites of scholarship that he uh, puts in his report. But at one time we spoke all the time, and now he won't help me. But he um, he, he noticed that um, the reason why it reads plural, first of all, there's an accent over the final letter, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. obviously consonants don't have accents in greek number one number two the the omega and the iota after the letter noon has a specific shape like it looks it, it's not like a noon omega iota it actually has a specific uh ligature that he identifies in his uh study so point is he is the authority he thinks it's a forgery that's one thing but he knows it doesn't say naked man with naked man that's a western construct of ignoramuses who really don't know anything about handwriting from that period so yeah. um i have a paper i've written where uh i i'm submitting it uh, hopefully again with daniel gulata i'm waiting for him to say yes you know like a, a bride at the altar waiting to get married but anyway um uh there's no doubt that uh, Morton Smith was wrong about what the document says, which to me says if he is wrong about that, he's also wrong about the number of uh, times that certain uh, abbreviations appear. He's wrong in other instances. His, the his more times veils, he's wrong, the less likely he's the forger. His Seven Veils translation is wrong as well, as Scott Brown put so. And and so, you know, I actually talked to all these people, like like not all of them, but I talked to people who are on the forgery side, I talked to people who are on the authenticity side. Nobody wants to admit that Morton Smith made a mistake. The, uh, the people who are for authenticity will just build up uh, like a defense around how great Morton Smith is, and he couldn't have made this mistake. And all the forgery people, oh, no, no, we're not going to let you get away with that. He said that because he's gay and this. I think we have to admit that the first academic study by an expert was taken place in 2008 when Selicus looked at the document and he transcribed as an authority and a professional a specialist in this sort of writing, he is the first guy that got it right. So is the document about homosexuality 
Only if we're talking about massive numbers of gay guys getting together and having sex. All right. So, but that's not what Morton Smith said the document was about. So, if you believe there was an all male orgy, and that's what they're referring to, then okay, there's homosexuality, but uh, or possibly homosexuality, but the plural form could include women, and it could include regular, like an example. People nowadays, nudity, if I see a naked guy walking outside, I'm like, oh my God, there's a naked guy. Either he's crazy or he's a pervert, right? But in ancient times, people were always walking around. The, the athletes were naked. They had a much different attitude towards yeah, nudity. Absolutely. Right. And and this notion that nudity, I mean, I looked up that phrase, uh, naked man with naked man in ancient Greek inverted i think it's it's the it's the same two words but just in different order it appears in the church father uh um what is it basil i think it is uh, and then uh, also it appears in this uh, uh historian talking about uh libyans being bitten by snakes and that they used to take off their clothes and two men would would go together to get rid of the poison in some, from the snake bite so in neither of those references was naked man with naked men a sexual Another example from the Bible, from the Jewish Bible, the, the Christian Old Testament. Both Elijah and Elisha raised from death to, to a little boys, one each, Elijah and Elisha. Mm -hmm. And they do so by lying down, lying their bodies down on top of the child. Right. And nobody has ever, to my knowledge, accused Elijah and Elisha of homosexuality. So if we but accept why that. Are making, why are they making such a big deal out of this one when it's no different? Because, and, and if you want me to segue to this, it, I mean, how much time do I have? Because I was late. How much time do I have in this interview? I mean, we still got time. All right. We still got time. Don't worry. And, you know, I have, because of really when it comes down to it, I like gossip. Like the odd thing is with Morton Smith, you would think, people that know me would think, wow, this would, he, he likes gossip. Why doesn't he like the gossip about Morton Smith being a homosexual? Well, the reason I don't like it is there's actually really good evidence that for the early part of Morton Smith's life, he had he was in love with at least two Jewish girls. All right, there this is women. I don't know what the correct term is anymore. But anyway, but anyway, in that time in his life, in his twenties, um, David Flusser, who hated Morton Smith, when when he met, when he saw him in 1983, he called him that evil man. So Flusser hated Morton Smith, and in the notes that come from Quentin Kuznel's. Um, uh, a visit to Jerusalem in 1983, he records Flusser saying, oh, you know, um, he had a girlfriend. And then in, in the in article, when they published uh, the, the 25th anniversary, or the, is it 25th in 2008, is the 50th anniversary of uh, discovery in, in Biblical Archaeological Review, um, a professor in, in Israel knew the same story that, 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 that Kuzma records, which is that Flusser knew Morton Smith while he was in Jerusalem in the 1940s, had a girlfriend. All right, so this is, this is like an enemy who wants to say the worst things about Morton Smith, knew he had a girlfriend, and then they broke up because he wouldn't leave Christianity and the faith got in the way. All right, so that's number one. Number two, when the Biblical Archaeological Review came out, there was a lady that wrote into the, the magazine, and she said her mother was having an affair or, or a romantic relationship with Morton Smith in 1957 through 1958, right around the time that he was, uh, uh, you know, um, discovering the document in, in at Marsaba. Now, people will say, oh, he was, he's a beard or he's, you know, he's gay. Whatever. Why would a professor have an affair? That's like, oh, I, I want to prevent like, you know, I'm going to hide this gun by burying it in, in like a, a bomb. Like it doesn't make and it's worse. It'd be worse for his career to be carrying on an affair with a student's mother. So anyway, so he was having this affair uh, relationship with this woman. He comes back. She remembers him coming back from the the desert and describing how horrible it was, but very excited and enthusiastic about his discovery. And then there's a third relationship with a Jewish woman I found, which was that Corinna Gaster, the daughter of Theodore Gaster and uh, Lotta uh, Gaster says absolutely clearly that her her mother and morton smith were having a relationship with uh one another and while the behind the father's back so what i'm saying is it could have been bisexual you could say all these sort of things but he definitely has a pattern of love liking loving jewish women now 
That's yeah. that's just the fact. You can say there were other affairs. You can say this, but what they try and do is they link the naked man with naked man with supposedly this gay interest that he had all his life. Um, there was an Atlantic article, by the way. I mean, do we 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 mentioned the Atlantic article yet? I didn't get into there is a an Atlantic article. And I have to be very careful because I'm just doing research. This is just yesterday. I spoke with one of the subjects of the. Uh, this is hot off the press, so you're, you're actually interesting uh, uh, eye candy here. So uh, a very, very good journalist, uh, uh, Ariel Sabar, excellent writer, excellent researcher, works for The Atlantic, did a story of Morton Smith, and basically tried to show that he was gay. And um, didn't really offer anything new about the document or anything. But anyway, point is, that in that article, he found a family who uh, Morton Smith uh, was, you know, um, friendly with, and tries to insinuate that there was a romantic relationship going on with the father and Morton Smith. The reason for that was in 1952, Morton Smith went to the uh, monasteries of Greece and took this man with him. And he, you know, the Sabar, couches the story in a context of homosexuality before, after, and in the middle. But the family, they yes, they told him things that were included in the article. But they actually, the oldest son ended up writing a letter to the Atlantic complaining about the way he used their information. So, there. I mean, I don't want to get too much into this because, um, you know, it's just legal implications and everything. I don't want to accuse anyone of, of being, um, uh, what's this, uh, uh, wrong, uh, bad, bad. But the facts are the family complained about that aspect. And you can, if you read the article, it's extremely well written. He's in a fabulous writer masterful command of the english language great researcher but you can tell that he was trying to fit the information within a specific uh weaponized interest in homosexuality now whether morton smith was a homosexual later in his life you know like you look at like what, what was that guy forbes magazine malcolm forbes he was married he has that son who was the presidential candidate one year and then towards the end of his life he became gay you know he, he walked around with his boyfriend everywhere so these things happen where you start out one way and you end up another way but all i can say is the evidence that i amassed together were that there is no evidence of a gay lover that anybody's ever found nobody's ever found a boyfriend love letters nothing as far as i'm concerned all of this develops simply so people could sell books get their name out there in the public and make a pile which there is I, one I, thing that sabar does I bring up there is one thing he brings up which is um close to being he does bring up the fact that morton smith supposedly when they were making a gay and lesbian studies program at new york university he was, he's a great researcher. I'm telling you, Sabar is, he's in some ways, I have to hit my head. He could find stuff. He found that apparently Morton Smith wrote a letter saying that he wanted to come out of the closet in his support for this gay studies program. And then he didn't in the end. And it's something, there is evidence you can say that towards the end of his life, before he died, that somehow he took an interest in defending the rights of gay people. So, you know, and, and I have no problem with homosexuality or gay people. I, you know, I, I'm in the entertainment business. I work with creative people. I have no issues with whatever kind of lifestyle people want to choose. You know, the more intelligent people tend to be, you know, uh, different from cookie cutter people, you know? Yeah. So it, it's possible but I, I tell you, I did all my due diligence. I tried to find evidence of this either way. I could find no evidence of homosexuality for Morton Smith, except this Sabar guy. He found a letter that he supposedly was going to hand in, but didn't, that said he's coming out of the closet to support a gay studies program. That's I don't know what you oranges, think of that. Stephen. That's apples and oranges. Right. I'm straight. I support gay. My, I have only I one just, sibling. My brother is gay. He's been gay I, all his life, and I love my brother, and I will support my brother to the death because he is my brother. I don't care if he, what if, if he's attracted to aardvarks, whatever. That's his personal life. It's not mine. I love him, and so I'm a ardent supporter of the rights of people to have to have the right to love whoever they love, and that no. doesn't make me gay because I support them. I also support women, but as I think is plainly evident, I'm not one. 
These people need to have their heads examined. The problem isn't Morton Smith. It's these po these popularizers who make this stuff up and sell a lot of books. And then all of the scholars think it must be true. If I could summarize, I'll just say this. I see no evidence that he was homosexual at the time he discovered the 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 document. And the document clearly <laughs> does not reference naked man with naked man. So when you when you discount the one side and the other side, it really has no relevance to whether or not the document is a forgery. Yeah. The document could be a forgery. It, you know, there are legitimate questions that people can investigate, but the simple minded equation of a gay author, supposedly Morton Smith, and a gay gospel, supposedly Secret Mark, that you can't make those connections anymore. And people that do aren't paying attention to the facts. Exactly. And I just. I kept laughing at like the amount of work that's being put into trying to prove that he's gay, which is clearly homophobia, yeah. filled with homophobia. That's exactly. And I just, it's just, it's just hysterical to me. Well, I, to they, be fair, I mean, it's self criticism. I've done a lot of work proving my, I mean, you're in a field where. I mean, I, I counted the number. Uh, I think Tony uh, Burke has a a a a, a, li a website of apocryphal literature, and it, there's a list of articles written about the secret mark. I think it's 800 articles, about three pages. It's three pages. Eight, I think it's either 800 or 80, or uh, it's some massive number of articles that is just written on this document. It's unbelievable. And um, I mean, you let's put it this way. Why do should people care about this letter if it wasn't for the fact that it says Jesus is gay? That's what got the whole thing started. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Does it really change? Like my wife is is, is Catholic. You know, is it going to make her stop going to church because there's somebody discovered a piece of paper from some church father that says to this person and that person there was a cause? No. People can still believe in what they want. It doesn't change anything. Yeah, but there's people out there who say Jesus was advancing uh, religion using entheogens, drugs, in order to achieve a spiritual high. Mm -hmm. There are those people out there. there there's all sorts of these these uh, theories out there, but, and I welcome them. I don't have to agree with them, but I welcome them because the dialogue is important. But the secret gospel, it's kind of helping the secret gospel at least achieve some widespread interest because of this argument about whether Smith was using it to advance his gay agenda. But the letter is interesting for a whole lot of other reasons that I think are getting overlooked in the midst of this, this tempest in a teapot. If, if I can say this, why do I waste so much of my time on this subject? Cause just cause I love talking about myself. Um, I think that it is fascinating what the limits of knowledge are. That, you know, like we're all in this business with ancient documents or we're interested in ancient things. Some of us, because we believe there's a God who came into the desert and gave a bunch of people a stone or two stones. But the rest of us, I think we're fascinated by how much of the ancient past we can know and learn from and whether it's possible that a document could have been written on inside of a book that's a copy of something, a uh, manual. Like, I think it's fascinating to examine how we know things and how we learn about things. That's what I'm interested in. I'm interested in, is it possible that this document could have been written on the inside of a book from a scrap of paper or a fragment of a doc of a manuscript and then it came down to us because some crazy, uh, you know, uh, New York scholar just happened to just book a trip and, and, and look in the library. It's a fascinating, that's what I find fascinating. Like, do, do sometimes is life just, like winning the lottery like you just go you, you believe in something you go there see people say oh that's too good to be true it's too good to be true that somebody went into a library and found it but surely it does happen from time to time people make major discoveries uh the, the nagamani literature uh yeah, the you know, that i'm dealing with right now that that was a happenstance discovery as you know right. So, I mean, I think that the limits of knowledge are is a legitimate way to, to couch why this document. Is it possible that a letter of Clement was, by the way, uh, I don't know, I mentioned this before. There's another possible letter of Clement that nobody knows about, which is Epistle 366 of, uh, of Basil, uh, that, that there is this fake letter. They say Basil never wrote the letter, but all the passages come from, or they're like 
passages that are from Clement of Alexandria's Stromata. So there are these texts floating around in libraries, which are uh, pastiches of patristic uh, 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 books that somebody either put in a letter or was the source material behind the books that we have and nobody recognizes that this might be a letter of Clement. So it is possible that there are these other discoveries waiting to be discovered and we're too busy arguing about whether Morton Smith is gay. Scott Brown suggests in his book, you mentioned the, the Stromata and Scott Brown suggests in the book that when uh, that when Clement quotes from the Gospel of Mark in the Stromata, for those who don't know what we're talking about, the Stromata is Clement of Alexandria's great and famous masterwork, uh, that when he quotes from the Gospel of Mark in the Stromata, he's quoting from the secret gospel version because there are some variations. And I think Scott, Scott's got a really good point there. I'd like to go back to the chair earlier because um, when Stefan wasn't here, wasn't here earlier, we were talking about the chair. Sure. And I, yeah, you like that? You know, nobody. You know, I was supposed to make a documentary. True story. I actually went to Venice. I mean, I tried to live in this. You know, so I got this company. I had this stupid agent, like the worst. This agent did nothing, but she managed to get a documentary company interested. The same people that did that um, uh, Jesus wife document and then they got really burned with that jesus wife guy I, I dealt with all the people at, at discovery and i was dealing with all these meetings and they flew me to venice they flew me everywhere and and uh, i went to see the chair you know the chair it's like a like a kid's high chair it's like really small it looks like it's this massive chair and it's like it's like a you can put like a baby in the chair it's like really i mean even people must be really short or they had different ideas of chair but it looks like this picture you think wow is this throne like king arthur's throne and it's really like like a high chair it's like really it's very small but anyway go ahead uh, that's my anecdote go ahead <laughs> i want to go back to this inscription just for a second oh okay James, uh, can you remind Stefan what we were talking about regarding sure. this description earlier? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I was I was giving my own channel. I got I'm gonna see if I how fast I can pull it up on my screen again. Uh, just check in here, and I'll have it for you. But I, I had my own transcription and translation. Oops, I'm in the wrong one. That's why I can't find it. No wonder. Okay, here we go. Okay, yeah, it's it's written in Hebrew letters, but it's written left to right. And as I read it and translate it, I see it as saying the throne said to, to be of or supposed to be of Mark the Evangelist of Alexandria. It's probably a weird Hebrew translation going left to right of Latin throni dixit uelut Marcus Evangelista Alexandrinus. Mm -hmm. so that, that's how I read it, Stefan. Well, you know, I, I'll be honest with you. I had an Australian professor. This guy is like the smartest guy I ever met. Like, I'm not, he's, he's like Martin Smith at that level of smartness. Like, he he, he, he read Arabic, Greek, we can write in, write, I can make all in French and German. And his, his assessment, because who cares what I think, but he thinks that the first two letters that are on the uh, right side is it? No, the, the, uh, the person's right, our left, that the Aleph and the Sheen are uh, different in quality and character than the yeah. rest of the inscription. Yeah. Yeah. And he thought that somehow fire, it, it, it has something to do with uh, maybe fire. And then they wrote on it, like, all right, you, you guys want to hear that? I mean, I really, this is from like 20 years ago, but the 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 chair apparently there's a, a whole history. It was probably sold to Venetian uh uh like um what do you call them like merchants uh by the Arab invaders uh who had settled and conquered uh Egypt, let's say in the after the seventh century. Um I I mean I haven't brushed up on the exact uh, dates, but probably it was sold to them through intermediaries. Whether it originally came from uh, Saint uh, from Alexandria, I wrote an article, a paper that it is 
the Episcopal Throne of uh, of, of St. Mark, and it was published in the Journal of Coptic uh, Literature, and the guy who published it, he ended up dying in a, in a car crash like a few days later, so I hope that it wasn't, you know, because of me that he died in this car crash, but he's dead now, the, the publisher, and I was totally an unpublished author when he did this, so he was such a nice guy, he liked my paper, and um, I, I did a, 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 what do you call it, a um, overview of all the references to St. Mark's throne. And it's, it, you, if I could segue to Secret Mark, well, one of the things they say why Secret Mark is a fake is because they say that, oh, the uh, Alexandrian uh, uh, Episcopal line of Mark is only dates to Eusebius, that Eusebius invented the, the Episcopal uh, uh, lineage of Mark when in fact, uh, the, er, the as, or as long as we know of popes, uh, for instance, the, the word pope comes from Egypt. The, the, the Roman title of the, 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 the Patriarch of Rome was stolen from Alexandria. The Alexandrian Patriarch was called the, Papa. Yeah, the, the Coptic papacy. Yeah, well, not a Coptic papacy. Even the, the, they both called themselves uh, uh, Papa. And, 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 and like, I think it was... Um, Third, uh, middle third century is the earliest attestation in a letter that they've discovered uh, among, I think, uh, you know, the, the garbage dumps in Egypt. They found a letter addressing the Pope uh, as Papa. Interestingly, because, you know, you, you know Aramaic and Hebrew, um, Papa and Marcos have the same numerological value. I think it's uh, 400 and... 41, I think, or 431, 431 is the value of the letters in Greek of Mark, Marcos, and Papa. So there is a gematria of, uh, or iso, uh, whatever they call it in Greek, but it's it's uh, the same numerological value of both. And then the letter of Clement is telling about the church that St. Mark built on the shores of Alexandria, what the, you know, they call the cow pasture. It was the Jew, traditional Jewish quarter uh, where Ale where Alexander or Philo of Alexandria says they had the synagogue. Uh, a burger Pearson disputed that. He says no, 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 it was on the other side. It was in the Delta district. It wasn't on in Bucolia. But whatever the case is, Clement is referring to the original place where the Saint Mark's Church was. And then when um, uh, George the Ari Arian bishop who took over from, uh, you know, like the, 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 the Arians believed uh, Arius sat on the throne of St. Mark in Bucolia. That's what uh, uh, Epiphanius says. So there is a connection between the Arians uh, and Arius and the Church of St. Mark. So one of the reasons why we don't know that there was this tradition of St. Mark was because it was the native population of, of Alexandria that... Um, uh, you know, they were into St. Mark. The people that came to Egypt weren't so into St. Mark. So St. Mark is the traditional religion, and it was outside the city walls of Alexandria. So this is where the non-Greek population lived and where the poorer people lived. And then the city population of, of Alexandria were more in line with the orthodox beliefs of uh, the rest of the empire. So Arianism preserves, I believe, some aspects of St. Mark, and probably Arius sat on that throne. Yeah. And by my perspective, Stefan, Ari the whole Arius Athanasius battle, Athanasius, of course, represented the dogma of the West. Arius uh, represented the dogma of the apostolics, to use my term for the tradition. But, but they, they were from two different time periods, right? Like uh, 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 Arius was earlier and was already dead when uh, Athanasius was. Uh, yeah, but, yeah, but there were still Arians. Uh, and, there were, there were. Yeah, yeah, there, there were still. I, Athanasius wasn't fighting against a, a, a dummy, a, a straw-filled dummy. It was very much alive, and it was alive throughout all of the West. Uh, Pelagius, for example, was accused of being an Arian. And so it was very much alive. And but the point I'm trying to make is that Arius was, you're, you're saying that he was part of the, the Coptic, uh, what I prefer to say Coptic, the Coptic, uh, papal tradition, and I agree. I also see him as part of the apostolic tradition, the non-Pauline tradition of uh, faith relating to Jesus's teachings. That eventually the the Paulines and the and the modern Western uh, Christian religion extinguished. But Arius was a part of that. Athanasius represented the latter interests, the interests of the uh, dogmatic Pauline Western Church. 
and it eventually prevailed. So th the point you're making is good because the the they would have interpreted the earlier history of John Mark in that context. And therefore they had to make it fit with their context, their dogma, their perspective in order to make everything hunky dory. All I, all I can tell you is, that, I mean, having seen the, the 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 chair and you know done a paper on the iconography, the way that normal people look at it, and I'm not normal, but the way people, normal people look at it is they see it as the uh, 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 revelation of, of Saint John that that you have the four uh, winged uh, uh, the four living uh, creatures from Ezekiel, but are gathered around the throne, and that is an interpretation. I mean, it's it's obvious. I I'd have to argue. But if you look at the iconography, it looks to me very Jewish. Even though there are, there is no, uh, we don't have Jewish, you know, uh, uh, artifacts from an early period. You, you at least could imagine that it came from a Jewish background. I, d I don't know. I mean, I'm not, I'm not an expert, but I argue in my paper that um, it's a very early. Uh, uh, it didn't come from the fourth century. I think it's earlier, and I've cited other people who made the argument that it was even like could be second century and earlier. It it, it just seems to me like it knows uh, the Jewish context of early Christianity, and that takes us to Philo of Alexandria, who was a big influence on Clement and the Alexandrian tradition. So, uh, Christian tradition. So, um, in the same way that you have. Uh, uh, Clement and Oregon citing and developing ideas and themes that were originally spoken by a Jewish writer, um, the chair to me is reflective potentially of something that could even have been uh, sitting in the synagogue of, of Alexandria without, of course, the top piece that is overtly Christian. Yeah, I, I will footnote, <clears throat> we do have a, a good amount of Jewish art from that period. Interestingly enough, a lot of them done in glassworks. They were they were uh, ampullae that were made in the Jewish tradition, and they have exactly these kind of motifs that you mentioned, Stefan, because traditionally they were the motifs that were on the walls and the curtain hangings in the temple. So the, you're right in your assessment, uh, and there's a lot of evidence to support it, that these are indeed prob probably Jewish motifs on the chair, on the city of, of uh, St. Mark. And not only that, but I mentioned the apostolics earlier, the apostolic tradition, as opposed to the Pauline tradition, did not reject, but embraced the Jewish heritage of Jesus and uh, kept very much alive a close connection between Jesus's teachings and the Jewish faith. Where, as you know, there was a lot of accusation in the Western church, the, the Pauline descended church of Judaizing. You could get killed, you could get executed if you were accused successfully of having Judaized. Uh, the whole change in the in the tonsure, for example, uh, from the earlier tonsure, which uh, was based on the uh, the Nazar of the Nozrites, the uh, vow taken to honor God that's described in number six, uh, in which you'd form the hair into a crown around the head. This was changed into a different kind of tonsure for, this way. Uh, the Roman tonsure, and it was specifically to avoid the accusation of Judaizing. That's why the date of Easter was moved away from, from uh, Passover, Pesach, etc. So you're absolutely right in everything you say, Stefan. And I, I, I and I, what I'm saying, right, I should have married you. My, my wife tells me I'm right like one time a year, but anyway, uh, uh, go ahead. Yeah, no, I'm just saying there's, there's good proof for everything that you said. Okay. So, um, I mean, all, all but the truth about the if you go to uh, uh, Venice and you look at the Church of Saint Mark in Venice, where the where the uh, relic is kept, on the outside they have the whole story of the translation of the relics of Saint Mark from Egypt to. Uh, it's a big deal in in Venice. Like it, it was, uh, you know, uh, I think that the Venetians used it to g give them almost independence from Rome. That's why. What was their interest in the relic? They thought if you were an apostolic see, then you would have independence from Rome. So if there, what was in it for them, why they probably gave up the equivalent of millions of dollars for these relics was it meant they didn't have to kind of listen to what Rome was saying. I think right. that was what it was. It really is a modern invention. 
They right. were city states, independent right. and competitive city states for a very long time, and still there is a great deal of of, of such competition between Florence and Venice. And but I, and I still think that it gave Venice prestige it didn't have by making them the Sea of Saint Mark. It wrote it it it, it made them equals to or at least could stand on the same footing as rome i think that's why it ended up there like what how did this relic because i i think when i was in in venice they have the the relic of saint mark they also have uh uh, uh some church fathers that are so they, they were obviously buying up um you know dead bodies and relics just to yeah, give them it was a, yeah, that was a, a like status, yeah. Street, stealing yeah. Uh, there were thieves who would break into eastern sites, steal the dead bodies, and bring them back to the west because that, that was a fight for who could get more pilgrim tourists sent to their town. One of my studies was Mary Magdalene. Uh, there there <clears throat> was a huge battle between various cities and what is now France as to who had the real Mary Magdalene. And they, they fought vociferously about it. And finally, the Pope had to intercede to stop the battle between these two cities. It, and, it, and, and in the there. acts, there was of even Saint... an attempt by Catholic uh, Roman Catholic thieves to steal the body of Muhammad <laughs> and bring it back and put it in a church in the West because the, it would bring in a lot of pilgrim. Tourists. But about the throne, the, the the principal evidence that I found for the earliest mention of the throne was in um, the Acts of Saint Peter of Alexandria, where mm -hmm. there's a moment where. They don't explain how he gets there, but you know, as I mentioned, the 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 Bucolia, the cow pasture, was outside of the control of uh, the imperial government. It was in the, the wilderness where all the bandits were, and somehow the Pope of 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 Alexandria ends up in this, you know, uh, where the throne of Saint Mark is, and he he goes to visit the tombs where all the, the old patriarchs are. And there's the body of St. Mark and there's the body of all, uh, all the famous predecessors. And that's where, when he's praying, St. Mark appears to him and explains to him, he's going to die and don't worry about it. He's going to be great. And, and then he goes outside and they kill him. So, uh, I forget who kills him. There's, a, there's two versions. There's one version where the bandits kill him, I think, and there's the other one where, where I think the soldiers kill him or something. But um, but that's where the earliest reference is to the throne of St. Mark. And and so, uh, you know, the descriptions that I gathered from the various early writings, that was, that was the earliest, that there ever was a reference to the chair of St. Mark. James, could you talk about why you think that it's sort of a copy of the secret gospel of Mark in here or some something connected to John yeah, Mark? It, the, the image that you see there, if, if you look uh, to the viewer's right uh, of what would be under the left forearm of the imaginary, very tiny person sitting in the chair, you can see an opening. It looks a little bit like a letterbox. I've read a number. I'll, I'll be interested what Stefan thinks. I've, I've read a number of theories of what it was. The most common is that it uh, is there in order to hold the ashes of some departed saint, most likely John Mark himself. But what I wonder is whether that might be where the copy of the secret gospel of Mark was held in early times. According to Clement's letter, it was reserved for only the most advanced students, students who could handle successfully, thoughtfully and intelligently without panicking the profound wisdom that Jesus apparently revealed in the secret gospel. So I suspect that it may have, this this letterbox, this hole that you see, may have been to hold the manuscript of the secret gospel because it was never widely published. It was just held in reserve for those finest students. It's really small. If you see it, it it's smaller than you think. Like when you look at these pictures, like I said, you think it's going to be like, I don't know what, but it, it's like, it's yeah. it's like so I, I I don't know what the hole is for I, I I don't have an idea but um I think from what I remember again from reading these other uh archaeological studies that in Saqqara there are thrones and they're similarly shaped like there's a city in Egypt so mm -hmm. I I think for whatever reason they built these like baby chairs for people. Like, I mean, you you could not be fat and sit in this chair. You would have to be. I guess they were ascetic and you know they had, you know like. But um, 
the basic thing is I have no idea what that hole was for. A book, uh, who knows? Um, the, the description of uh, of the secret gospel is such that the uh, it was kept. You know, the gospel was guarded, probably in the holy of holies, like in a separate area. So I'm not really sure that that's necessarily true. I don't know that it isn't true, but. Um, you know, uh, it, it was fair to speculate, but um, I, I I have no idea to be honest. Yeah, that's just that's just my theory. There's nothing backing it up, but it, uh, it's just in addition to the possibility that some saint sashes, probably John Marks, were held in there. I I'm suggesting that in a codex form, it would fit very nicely in there. The codex codices in those days were pretty small, and it would go in the hole. Uh, like you, I've seen it, Stefan. So I'm, I'm I'm aware of the size of the hole in question and the hole thrown. Yeah, it, it, and then the, the, I don't think it's seen in the photo, but the top piece is broken off. There's actually a break, so um, uh, it, it, it's not exactly clear what is, um, you know, I mean, it, whether that was original, did they carve something else and put it there? N nobody knows. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a lot of questions. It needs more study. Yeah. And I and I, I think it was before you came on, Stefan, that I was saying it's really a pity that there has been as little published study by scholars as as we've seen. Like if you look at the at the river, there's a on the back of uh, on the backrest of the of the throne, yeah. there's an image of the uh, Garden of Eden, which mm -hmm. conforms to the Samaritan idea of the Garden of Eden being on Geritzim, like uh, on the Holy Mountain. Like the Samaritans believe, great, you know, everybody's got crazy beliefs, but the Samaritans believe that on the top of Geritzim, there used to be, used to be taller. Like what we see today as Geritzim is only part of the original, and, and the mountain originally went up into heaven. Like yeah. it went all the way and on the top was paradise. So yeah. I guess they had this idea that the four rivers, if you look at it, the Rapala rivers are flowing down from a height. So it, it conforms somewhat to the Samaritan idea of paradise being uh, at the top of the mountain. Yeah, so, of course, Genesis uh, describes the Garden of Eden as having four rivers flowing from it. So, yeah, you're on, you're on familiar ground. Yeah. All right, I'm going to take a super chat question. Igor, thank you for your super chat. What is the esteemed opinion about the failed aborted resurrection show that Secret Mark is actually about? Would you dare to opine about the kind of games they did play in Holy Land? Was there a documentary that they were trying to make? Is I never knew that. I don't either. I never heard about this. The, 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 you know what the problem is? Here's the problem. The problem is that in order to make boring stuff sexy, you have to like <laughs> make it like you compromise your authenticity. So if you make it all about sex and orgies and all this sort of stuff, people, oh, they think, the executives think, oh, everyone's going to come flocking to see this, you know? And then um, but then what happens is, then now that we live in this world of social media, everybody's going to, you have all these like experts who are going to weigh in and say this is complete garbage. So, you know, there is a, a faction of people that want to keep everything boring, Right, because everything is kind of boring. I mean, it is like a, a book religion, and it's serious. And you know, the gospel is the gospel. But anytime you try and you know sexify it, then everybody is up in arms saying, "But they like to do it in return to destroy the value of the work." They're very happy to bring on Mark Morton Smith's sex life, and and why this is it can't have happened. So. I personally believe that you could do a documentary on Secret Mark and you could do a fascinating journey through, you know, that we, there's nothing wrong with not knowing the right answer. I think we live in a world where everybody thinks everything's decided. The document, I think it's an authentic document, but it's possible that it isn't. And I'm happy with accepting the likelihood that I'm right. At the same time, I think the four Gospels, Mark, Matthew, Luke, John, are fakes too. I, I, I think that, like, you know, uh, Matthew is a copy of Mark. Luke is a copy of Mark. John knew uh, uh, Matthew or Luke and certainly uh, Mark. So, you know, we live all our documents to some degree. The Mark and I said the Pauline epistles were all corrupted. So, I mean, there is no such thing. Uh, Mark and I rejected Acts. So yeah. we, we, we live in a context where all our religious documents, to some degree, are forgeries. 
And maybe Mark isn't, or maybe Mark is a copy of the Mark and I gospel. But I mean, to act like the idea of a fake gospel is so scandalous and unheard of is a joke because the history of Christianity is filled with forgery. Like Deuteronomy, Morton Smith, I'll bring a Morton Smith reverence. Morton Smith famously said that Deuteronomy was the first uh, Jewish pseudepigraphon, uh, 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 the, the first fake book, the first pseudo document of the uh, Jewish religion was Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy means second law. So somebody came along, saw the four books of Moses, said, let's do another version of it, and it became Deuteronomy. So um, the religion is full of fakes, and Secret Mark may be a fake, it may be authentic, and you could do an exciting documentary about Secret Mark, just asking the question, is it real, is it not real? Yeah, to take another example, the famous Gospel of Jesus' Wife a fragment that was uh, put out there by Karen King from uh, a number of years ago, <clears throat> in which it supposedly says that uh, Jesus speaks about his wife, Mary. Now, it's been widely uh, said now that it's a forgery, but I'm not 100% sure. People ask me. I'm 100% sure it's a forgery. But, 100%. But my, my point, well, my point is this. Forget the gospel of Jesus and his wife, whether or not it says Mary is his wife. Because the gospel of Philip, which is definitely an old gospel, not a modern forgery, the gospel of Philip clearly refers to Mary as his konuntos, uh, which means his companion, way of saying wife, and refers to him kissing her often on the, and the word's a little fragmentary, but it does look like it says kissing her often on the mouth. So we have this in the Gospel of Philip. Nobody gets excited about the Gospel of Philip, which says the same thing as this. What made it sexy, Stefan, and here's your right. What made it sexy is the combination of uh, it's Jesus says it's Jesus' wife and the possibility of forgery. Oh, boy, that sells newspapers quickly. I, we could do something interesting about the realities and without getting into all the excesses just to sell books and make careers. I can't pronounce pseudepigraphone. So that the, 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 uh, I, I, for some reason, my last segment, I could not pronounce that word. I must be very stupid. But anyway, go, go, go ahead. Yes, yes. Pseudepigraphy, pseudepigraphy, pseudepigraphy. <laughs> <laughs> Just practicing. Uh, yeah, no, that, 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 that's it. I, 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 these, these materials are fascinating in and of themselves. I was before you come, came on, Stefan. I was talking. I've been working recently with Papyrus York Syrinkus five five seven seven. Recently discovered, it's just been published very recently in the latest volume of the of the Oxyrhynchus papyri, and I'm uh, so I've thrown myself into a boiling sea of turmoil because uh, a lot of the uh, especially feminist scholars are looking at this as a documentation of the importance of Mary Magdalene as Jesus's wife as his companion, mm -hmm. and which I talk a lot about in the book, but I'm looking at it. And when they're also saying it's probably part of the Gospel of Mary, another non-canonical gospel. And first of all, I find the translation to be completely off the beam. I, I, there are words in there that are that have nothing to support them in the Greek. The uh, the uh, way that the translator has translated various of the declensions has no relationship to the actual declensions in the Greek. It seems to me to be skewed in a way that makes it sexy. And I, I abhor that kind of, quote, scholarship, end quote. Well, if I could say something bad about Morton Smith, I, will, I, I, like to, I like to balance. I don't know what's wrong with me, but I like to balance everything out. I am wondering aloud whether he deliberately chose naked man with naked man. Like, like, I know everybody says he's this forger, and they're all like, okay, and he's gay, and he did all this. But... You know his student, Marvin Meyer, who was a friend of mine. I was the first person to announce that he died. But Marvin Meyer famously translated the Gospel of Judas, and he chose words that were, um, you know, if they weren't there, they were there to gain attention to his translation. So um, it might well be, I mean, I'm open to the possibility that Morton Smith could have chose, instead of having something sort of namby-pamby and boring, like nakeds with naked, it's... I'm open to the idea that he might have translated something a certain way to, he wasn't sure, but he might have translated it to make it kind of more sexy, as we were saying. 
that it becomes provocative because there is a Jewish tradition that that Jesus was gay, right? Like 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 in the uh, in 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 the Jewish literature about Jesus, uh, Judas yeah. and yeah. Jesus are flying, and and uh, and and Judas uh, defiles is the word Jesus, and you know, so yeah. I mean, the, the translation or the the implication is he sodomizes him. So, um, you know, so these ideas, maybe Morton Smith was attracted to the idea of a connection between the study of Jewish writings and uh, his discovery, but he mistranslates his discovery. The discovery says something other, in it, as I mentioned, at least three places, there is a incorrect translation or transcription on the part of Morton Smith. And I'm open to the idea that he may have done it to gain notoriety to his discovery it's possible i uh, i didn't know morton uh, uh directly i know him i th very much through completely through people who studied with him friends of his who have told me their own personal recollections and he's a genius and, he's a complete genius yeah. and this you know, no question the, I, I consider him to be the best we had in the 20th century in this field but he was not perfect he did, he did make mistakes, uh, but nevertheless, he was a brilliant man and an excellent scholar. But I don't see him from what I've been told by those who knew him well, uh, someone who would stoop quite to that. It, I agree you're right, you're right, you're right. But I, I just mean, don't see the Morton I've come to know indirectly, and I grant indirectly, as capable of doing that. He, see, he seemed to be a very prudent man, a very... Uh, button down kind of individual. I mean, you you mentioned the affairs with the three Jewish women, and yes, but he he didn't talk about that. He didn't make a big knowledge. He was very careful to keep that quiet and keep his private life. Separate I, I, I just hate knowledge. being like this prude who's always defending him, and then people say to me, "Oh, don't you think that?" Uh, I mean, I'm just saying like there is a mistake in the translation in the transcription that there is. I mean, so. I wonder, like, actually, I received today, I swear to God, it was today, uh, it was within 24 hours, I received the original black and white photos that he used to make his transcription, which actually are more clear, because they're in the, uh, the seminary in, in New York. So I, I got a scan of, of those documents. I also found new photos that uh, Quentin Kuzno had, had, had taken. I'm waiting for them to come. And the more I look at the uh, actual original photos, there's no way he should have translated it as naked man with naked man. I know that people will say, oh, Warren Smith, he knows everything. He, I'm telling you, if you look at the actual letters, there is no way that it says naked man, but there's a clear accent over the final iota. It is no, it can't be disputed. So the question is, how could he have made this mistake? So I don't know. I mean, uh, I don't think he's a forger. I don't think it's forgery, but he, um, he made mistakes. I mean, the the seven veils translation that he has of what actually means seven seals is an example. That's that's an error. It's just a simple error. And I, I, I again, I hear you stuff, but I just I can't believe that's possible. I, well, I, all, I, all I know is I'm actually working on a movie, like a movie script. It's terrible, right? But I, I am working on a movie script, so I, it makes me start thinking about the person of Morton Smith more than just what he wrote and what he did. And, um, you know, you have to, I'm not saying anything, I mean, the more I hear about him, he was an exemplary person. He was, he spoke Hebrew, fluent Hebrew in the 1940s in when nobody, I mean, you know, when, when Goyim did not speak Hebrew. So he was, he could literally have conversations with Hebrew speakers in what was then Palestine to, you know, and when even Jews didn't. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, and I think part of the reason Flusser didn't like Morton Smith, I have to investigate this more, but he was more Jewish in a way than, than mm -hmm. Morton Smith was more Jewish mm -hmm. than he was. Mm -hmm. You know, like, uh, Flusser came from a Christian school and, and, and he only became a Jew when he went to Israel. I mean, he, he, he was uh, brought up Christian. So, mm -hmm. you know, like I hate to say it, but sometimes when you meet somebody of your background and they're not from your background and they know more about your culture and they're more exempl mm -hmm. they, they exemplify mm -hmm. your culture more, that could have been part of his resentment. Again, I'm just speculating. I don't know for a fact, mm -hmm. but um, do you, um, Jake, do you want some new new information about Secret Mark? I, I mean, it's not nothing really exciting, really, but um, as you know, I'm the guy that preserved the uh, Quentin Kuznel uh, archives. Originally, Kuznel, he died, and they were going to throw all his, his stuff in the garbage. 
and they were just dumping on the street. And so I didn't know what to do because, like, you know, I didn't want to go. If I go there, they would say, oh, yeah, of course, Mr. Holler, you must have tampered with all this evidence. You went in there and you, you wrote I Love Secret Mark and, you know, whatever. Anyway, so was he, he was a prominent critic. So I got David Trobisch, actually, who is a great guy. The, I met him in Germany. He's, like, the coolest guy. Anyway, so he... he um, I interviewed him, too. I mean, well, he, at the you, conference. You, yeah. you like him? You like him? Oh, yeah. Yeah, he's the best. He's the best. Anyway, and, and on top of it, he took me to a real German restaurant. And and uh, anyway, long, long story. Anyway, so um, uh, I saved. I say we saved together his his, uh, his 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 writings. And there's all these photos of the document that were never have never been seen before, and all these uh, recollections of see of actually examining the document. And in those recollections, his notes that he took while he was there, what comes out of it is the actual Greek patriarchate in Jerusalem when he was there, believed the document was authentic. And people dispute that, oh, you, you can't say it. Yes, you can. Because the, the, the librarian, Callisto Sturvas, was saying to uh, Kuznel, was saying, yeah, I think it's 18th century handwriting. Yeah, I think it was there before. Yeah, there's other writings like that there. There were heretics, blah, blah. But the real shocking thing today that I found out today not shocking, but most people couldn't care less. But um, what I care about is that apparently when uh, Strumsa and Flusser and uh, 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 Pines and Callisto Sturvas went to Marsaba in 1976 to move the document from, uh, 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 from Marsaba to the Jerusalem Patriarch Library, um, apparently... Uh, uh, I knew this from before, most people don't, but Kuzno wrote that Seraphim, that Flusser told him that Seraphim, the, the monk who was there, didn't want to give up the book. They were fighting over the book. He was adamant. He goes, that's our property. Do not take, that's my book. That's our book. And it was a back and forth. And Flusser told, uh, uh, this is old news. This is not the news. The news is coming. So Flusser told Kuzno, he said, I'm surprised that the manuscript is still in Jerusalem in 1983 because uh, 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 Seraphim, the monk, really wanted the text there. It was their book. So he thought, this is our book. So this notion, that, oh, you know, they, all these forgers, they always bring up, oh, there's only 100 books uh, uh, listed as being in the library. Here's the new news. What I found out today is that Seraphim had been at the monastery since 1939. So how do I know this? Well, um, I was looking through and I, 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 they had a book online uh, in Greek of, of Seraphim. So Seraphim was born in 1900. He died in 2002. He lived to 102 years old. And he first came to Marsaba in 1939. So we, we've never had somebody inside of uh marsaba the greek who would tell us well, what did they think about this document so they this is a representative of somebody who basically lived there for 60 years and he thought the book belonged to them it was in their library and he must have i mean people can dispute this but he must have known the book before morton smith took it out of the library to look at. I mean, not took it out, but asked for it to look at it and examine it. So it was there because why is he fighting to keep a book that Morton Smith introduced to the library? And if I can say one more thing, just, just the, you know, I was thinking with this all, all day today. Morton Smith says, ah, I found something. Obviously, he must have told everybody, I found this interesting letter. He must have showed the monks, okay? Then he, he goes back to America with his photos and he publishes the, his discovery in a Greek Orthodox magazine that's or a journal that's published in Jerusalem. And he tells the patriarchate, hey, I did all this. So everybody in that whole organization knows he's discovered something in this book, this Voss Ignatius book. You're trying to tell me that these monks who don't have a PlayStation, don't have cable, they got nothing else to do but look at these boring old books, that they somehow didn't clue in that this American added a book that they never had before. Impossible. Absolutely. And now that we know a monk was there since 1939 and was there when they moved it in 1976 and wanted to keep the book, it doesn't prove that the book was there originally, but it's certainly suggestive of an attachment to the book. And it was not planted by Morton Smith. They would have figured out it was a plant. That's my new my new story. You like that? More, Stefan, as you know, the, the letter in the book have disappeared 
the book is there. The book's yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. Since the eighties, and and they don't they don't know where it is right now. And I was suggesting again, this is a hypothesis without any proof, but I was suggesting mm -hmm. that this was a deliberate decision on the part of the monastery leaders to make it disappear because it is so controversial. And I hardly need to tell you the nature of the controversy is a very sensitive issue in the Middle East. I don't think it has any political. You you you, you want to hear? I, this is the one subject. I mean, like like you know, some people know about bottle caps and stamps. I know about this subject. So, um, this is it. The book is on the shelves. Uh, at Celicus, uh produces it for his 2008 uh, study of the book. He has the book, and the very he notices on page 11 there is a bunch of letters written. He says it's like a forgery. That's that's the forger practicing his writing. Who's no in his notes saw the same. Uh, 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 little scribbles on page eleven. He says it doesn't look anything like the the manuscript. So I mean, he's a for the king of all forgers says nothing to do with it. But um, I do believe uh, when when um, uh, uh, Agamemnon Selicus liked me, believe it or not, he did a lot for me. So he has a reason to hate me because I made him do all this stuff. But I sent him to talk to uh, Ar Arch Mandrate or Mandrite. Meloton, the other guy who was there at the uh, at the um, uh, what do you call? It? Who was there transporting the document from Marsaba in 1976? And Meloton said, "You know who?" I, he didn't say it in so many words, but when they asked him where they think the manuscript is, he pointed to one official inside the Greek Orthodox. Patriarchate, who had an interest, who was he says was always interested in the manuscript. So it's probably um, there. Th this guy was uh, this. Uh, what do they call them? Um, this archbishop. What he studied in the West. He went to a British university, and he studied with George de Dragas, who's uh, at a Holy Cross University. And um, he gave. He was actually in the room. He says when when Kuznel was asking for the document in, in 1983. But this uh, uh, official, it's probably in his desk. If there's one person, yeah. Theophanes, his name is Theophanes of Garash. That's the guy who probably it's in his desk. That's yeah. where I think. If I if, if they had a gun to my head and said, "Where's the document?" I would say it's probably with Theophanes of Garash. That makes perfect sense to me. Sick of us yet? No. <laughs> oh no, not at all. <laughs> I'm gonna pull up a question. Um, if all right, we have questions. So I think. Right, go ahead. Yeah, we've got Brett. He's uh, he's asking, was he Mark the Evangelist, an Arian Christian, being from Alexandria? Arian spelled incorrectly. Arius. It comes from Mars. Uh, Aries. It's the root of the word Arius. Is Aries the god of war? Nothing to do with Arian and Hitler and all this stuff. Yeah, yeah. Arius himself uh, was, to use the common phrase, tall, dark, and handsome. He he was a celibate, but he, but his preaching ability was so powerful, so magnificent that that according to records at the time, women just swooned away at you know this tall, dark, really? handsome. I never and knew that. Ath and Athanasius was was this ugly, dumpy, fat guy who could hardly speak clearly. Yet somehow Athanasius won the battle. The question that's that's like asking whether uh, Jesus was a Republican or Democrat. It's it's th this is a question from later times. Mark the Evan uh, Mark the Evangelist was in the first century, long before these battles really were well underway. Edward M says, "What about the recent Bar article by the most prestigious Greek paleographer who claims Morton Smith forged it?" That's the guy I'm referencing. I'm referencing that guy. Tzalikas, he, he is a genius. He knows everything. So how can I dispute that a genius thinks it's a forgery? That is, mm. I mean, on the one hand, I'm torn because he does correctly transcribe the entire document. He is the world's leading authority on this writing, handwriting from this period. All that I can say is I can quote Agamemnon Selikas's own words against him. In Greek, in a published article, I don't know the exact year, he himself says that a paleographer has a different uh, uh, job than a, uh, the Greek word is uh, uh, 
a graphologist. I don't know what that translates, but like a document examiner. He himself says that a a a uh, a paleographer isn't can't go to the court of law and tell you that a, sig a handwriting isn't from uh, the person in question who signed the check. His job is he can examine, he can describe, he can tell you about the characteristics of the writing, but he himself says, I can't go into court and tell you if it's a forger or not. However, when the Biblical Archaeological Review asked him to do it, he was more than willing to do it. So, you know, people are inconsistent, but at one, uh, I will say he is the world's leading authority. He knows more than anybody. You, uh, if, Like I did, you could ask 100 Greek paleographers there's that many of them in the world and they will all tell you ask agamemnon Selicus. so he is the authority but at the same time even he admits in his most honest hour he is not trained to detect forgeries yep. and and bar uh certainly was always help, uh shanks's uh intention that bar be a, a foundation for all sorts of controversy because it sells copies of the magazine Herschel Shanks stirred up quite a few himself. But he he was a he he loved Morton Smith. He, yeah, he, he did. truly loved Morton Smith. Yeah, I know. Yeah. No, I'm not I'm not knocking Herschel Herschel out of the water. He did a lot of good. I mean, he got the Dead Sea Scrolls out for us, didn't he? But but he did love a good controversy. Sure. So my closing question. Um James. How do you think the secret Mark gospel helps us understand the synoptic problem or help solve the synoptic problem is really what I should be saying, asking. The, the synoptic problem? Mm -hmm. How does the secret Mark assist in solving the synoptic problem? Does it assist in solving the synoptic problem? I, yeah, I'm not sure what you mean by that because I don't have a problem with the synoptics. <laughs> Um, no, what I, I mean, it, what I mean is, is, is secret mark a source for Matthew and Luke? Let me just put it that way. Oh yeah, no, yeah. What I see the secret gospel, this is a this is a single sentence, so it's so it's probably not terribly accurate in and of itself. But the secret gospel of Mark seems to me to be a bridge between the synoptic gospels and the Johannine tradition, because there it's like the Egerton gospels and some other manuscripts. This this Oxyrhynchus papyrus I'm working with right now. It's an interesting blend of both Johannine phraseology and terminology, as well as synoptic. So what I see it is, as the, what Clement describes as the third version, the third uh, recension of the Gospel of Mark, uh, written after the, after the author had, had access to the Aramaic drafts of the Gospel of John. Because as I look at the Greek quotations of the secret gospel, with my Aramaic brain, I see word for word, just about word for word, what I have in the Aramaic drafts of John. So there is a close connection. And what I also just suggest to Stefan before he came on is, unlike today where everything is competition, back then these gospel writers were close friends. They were brothers in spirit. They were all about the same thing and they freely shared with each other. So we find passages from one gospel and another gospel. There are quite a few examples of this. So I don't see a synoptic problem. What I see here is the modern theory that John is a loner gospel off there by itself. Matthew, Mark, and Luke have something in common going on that John isn't a part of. This shows that that is actually an incorrect view. It's a distorted view and that there are connections. There are intimate connections. Uh, uh, Paul... Paul, oh golly, what is his name? I can't think of his name, last name at the moment. But he's done some great uh, studies of the Acts of the Apostles. That uh, he shows how it quotes or paraphrases the Gospel of John in uh, in 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 that work, and Luke as well. So there are more connections than we have recognized, and the Secret Gospel is a part of that. It, it, there really is one continuum of all of these early Gospels, both canonical and not. And Stefan, are you planning on getting um, new material out there based, published based on the new things that you were talking about in, in our stream today? Um, I am. Um, the problem is, is that um, it's a lot of work and doesn't pay that great. Um, you, you know, I mean, really, I mean, you tell average people, you're like, oh, you're working on a paper. How much you get for that? Nothing. Oh, <laughs> well, you must get like, you must have uh, attract people to a book you've written. No. 
and all you at the best what you get is people criticizing your work and they'll end up publishing something that says you're an idiot at worst you'll be ignored and then you wasted three years of your life doing nothing um i i you know why why am i interested in this this is an important question my, my wife i'm bringing my wife she brought up something today she said you know we were talking about something else and um she said like can people fight for the truth if they don't believe in god that's what she i mean she sounds like she's some mother Teresa, but she talked about other things too but um it's a i think it's a fundamental question does the truth matter does it matter if why can't we just agree morton smith was gay and the document, uh, the secret mark was written by him because he was angry at everything, at, at the world, that they couldn't accept that he his homosexuality, so he re took revenge on everybody and made this forgery and went overseas and put this uh, book in a monastery in order to finally destroy this religion that oppressed him. The reason why it doesn't work is it doesn't fit the reality the reality was he carried a priest card to his very death and even his supporters don't understand it because it sounded like he was an atheist who had given up god but to this very day of his death he considered himself or was still associated himself with the priesthood um people are complex the truth is complex and the more that we try and make truth fit within an agenda the more we're doing a disservice to truth. So I think, why do I publish? Why should I publish? Why should he publish? Why should everybody try to search after the truth? Because it reminds us of how complex life and reality really is. I couldn't agree more. I, what got me into this field, I mentioned back in 1972, reading the Gospel of Philip, I, I discovered it in a university, a library, and I, I saw, I was reading an early French translation of the Gospel of Philip, and I got to these lines about Jesus's companion, Kononos, and about his kissing her on the mouth. Uh, and then this is the Menier, Menard, I'm sorry, Jean-Philippe Menard translation. And I stood up in a university library where you have to be quiet. I stood up and I shouted out loud, they've been lying to us. Well, it's a little more complicated than that. And then I've been spending the 50 years since, 52 years since then dealing with that. But exactly, Stephen, what keeps me going on this uh, uh, it, 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 to the despite of the inattention that I get, the snarky remarks I get, uh, the, the snooty the snooty attitudes I get from some of my colleagues, is this: I am I am determined to do my very best to put out the truth as I see it, and to get rid of the lies the that uh, are there just to kind of enhance somebody's career. To say what I think really happened. I'm in retirement. I owe nobody nothing. I don't have to worry about a university career anymore. They can have it. But now in retirement, I can work on this. Ask my poor wife. You mentioned your wife. My poor wife who puts up with me more than 12 hours a day down in the trenches reading these manuscripts and struggling with it. And she says, what do you do this for? Why are you breaking your brains open on this? And I say, because I want to get the truth out there. Well, thank you both for joining me today. This has been a very fun stream. It's been a barrel of fun. Great, great to be with you both. I, I really enjoy talking with both of you very much. And I uh, much appreciation from down here in beautiful downtown Panama. Maybe I'll give my Insta uh, 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 so that I can get girls. I'm really here for the girls. I'm not here for the I was lying. I, I'm here for the girls. Well, come down to Panama. <laughs> we have more beautiful women per square inch. Thank you. I, I, I should have blown it. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye, right, everybody. Thanks for watching. Take care. Thanks. Hello, viewers. Thanks for watching this video from the History Valley YouTube channel. Please don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell. And if any of you wish to further support this channel, please consider checking out this channel's Patreon page and becoming a patron. And or donate through PayPal or through Super Chat during your live stream. Thank you.